Welcome to a detailed look at Guildmaster from Good Games Publishing, a programmed movement based fantasy themed board game where players take control of competing adventuring guilds. Thank you, Good Games Publishing, for sending us a review copy of this game to check out. No other compensation was provided. Guildmaster was designed by Chris Anthony and features artwork from Andrew Bosley, Alexander Mihalovic, and Yamadou Danielle Orchi. It plays two to four players in under two hours on average. It was published in 2020 by Good Games Publishing. This game has an MSRP of $49.99 US. Now in Guildmaster, players manage a fantasy adventuring guild competing with other guilds to become the most famous in the land. They do this by improving their guild hall, hiring adventurers, and completing contracts with those adventurers. Things get interesting when two or more guilds compete, driving up the cost of building, bidding for adventurers, or trying to complete the same contracts at the same time. In some cases, your guilds will agree to work together, but watch out for that inevitable betrayal. Check out what you'll get in the box for this fantasy game in our Guildmaster unboxing video on YouTube. So Guildmaster features a surprisingly thick but very concise and detailed rule book with a ton of examples. I would say that 40% of this book is dedicated to examples and artwork of how the game is played. There's also a standalone quick start guide that walks you through the first few turns of a four player game to make sure you've got the concepts down. Now, along with the rules, you get a main board, thinner individual player boards and guild upgrade boards, four great looking player screens with full rule summaries on them, dice in three different colors, a number of thick pre-cut counters, and three dicks of cards spelled split over action cards, adventurer cards, and contracts. Also, the adventurer and contracts are at different levels. Now, my only complaint about any of this is the fact the box insert is your standard cardboard trough with one cardboard piece you can add that splits it in two. Well, there are some baggies included. The big complaint I have about this insert is this is not a good insert for a card game with this many cards in it. The cards shift everywhere. Yes, you can put them into baggies, which helps, but it would have been nice to have like, like that divider should have went in a spot where the cards would have stood up nice. Yeah, this seems to be uh, an either or part of our reviews of late. They've either nailed the insert and we love it, or it's just not properly functioning and frustrating. Well, now that we have an idea of what you get in Guildmaster, how about you give us an overview of how to play? All right. This one's a little bit of a longer one. So we're going to start with setup. Setup in Guildmaster is quite involved and takes some time. You're going to put the board out on the table, place the round marker, the building cost marker, and a fame marker for each player on the board in the right spots, as well as face down adventurers of all three levels. The three decks of contract cards are shuffled and placed beside the board, along with all of the upgrade tokens, the dice, and a bank of coins. Each player is going to pick a guild they want to play, takes the guild board, the guild upgrade board, and the screen in that color. They also take a full set of action cards, the appropriate ribbon, and a contest token. Everyone each grabs seven gold and puts it on the vault in their player board. Now, starting teams are determined. Now, these are not teams of players. These are teams of adventurers, and players take the appropriate skill upgrade token for that team and the set of novice adventurers for the team. Now, each skill upgrade token has two sides. Players are going to pick which one to use. One of them is going to let you re-roll a die, where the other lets you set a die to a five. The two starting contracts, which are the same every game, are placed on the board. Then everyone is dealt three common contracts. They're going to pick two of those to keep as private contracts and then pay, place the last one face down on the board, filling the contract area of the board. Finally, all the face down cards on the board are flipped up. So for the adventure decks, you're just flipping the top card. For the contracts, you're flipping them all over. Note, with less than four players, there are some setup changes where some of the spots on the board won't be used and some cards are removed from the game. Now, while I didn't love the digital implementation of this game, it certainly saved a lot of hassle in the setup. Yeah. There's a lot of tokens to be sorted and stacked. It, it can be a little annoying, I will admit. This is one of those times where I tell the game owner to have the game set up when the other players show up, just to speed up getting the game to the table. Or play multiple rounds in a row that you don't have to deal with. Now, a game of Guildmaster normally lasts nine rounds. There is an option to play a shorter six-round game. 
At the start of the round, you're going to read off any events on the face-up contracts. On rounds three, six, and nine, players will also get to draw a new private contract. Next, you get to the plot phase. Players are going to use plot abilities on their adventurers and then tell everyone how much money they have for the next phase. It's not too many games where you announce how much cash you have on hand. One thing that really defines this game is sort of the mixture of perfect and imperfect information mm -hmm. along with that hidden action selection to add uh, intrigue and confusion into yes. open knowledge. Yeah, the fact you get to know just how much money people has indicates how important knowing how much money everyone has is in this game. Because then we get to the order phase. This is your programmed movement part of the game. This is done in secret from the other players using your screen so no one else can see what you're doing. You're going to play order cards and adventure cards from your hand along with potentially some money and place them on your guild board behind your screen. Now the guild board has four action spots on it, number one to four. At the start of the game, you're only gonna be able to use the first two slots and you're only gonna get to assign two adventurers at each slot. Now, both of these numbers can be upgraded with guild hall upgrades, which I'll talk about later. Any gold needed for the action also has to be dedicated now with the heroes on the spot you want to use them on. Money in your vault can't be spent once you're actually resolving these actions. Now, you use the action cards to indicate which of the actions you're going to take place, as well as like if you're recruiting a hero, which specific hero, or if you're going on a conquest, with, or sorry, going for a contract, which specific contract. You're going to layer that with the heroes and the money you need. Now, because of earlier steps, players will know what you can choose, but of course won't know what you are choosing yes. until the reveal. Now, many of the actions you're going to be taking require skill checks. So I want to take a moment to explain what a skill check is because it's going to matter for the rest of the game. These are basically done by taking your characters, your, your adventurers, and lining them up, and they have six different skills on them, and you're going to total up the number values for all your characters assigned to the task for that specific skill and roll that many six-sided dice and add them up together with a max of 10 per die roll. So for the record, while not an aspect of the physical game, this rolling is oddly the part of the digital yeah. version just failed at. Yeah, I honestly keep wondering if we were doing something wrong on the digital implementation because it would put the dice up for a short amount of time and they go away and you couldn't even spend enough time to total them. All right, so the actions are, here's your possible things you're going to send your adventurers out to do. You can build. You're going to spend gold to hire builders to improve your guild hall. Every builder bought increases the cost. So your first builder might cost three, your second might cost three, but your fourth might cost four. You, in this particular case, if you've spent extra money, if you put more money than you need on the action spot, you do get to take the, the change. You get to put that back in your vault. No, you do have to assign someone to hire them. So you will have to assign an adventurer. Now the various guild upgrades, I'm not gonna get into full details here, but they include skill upgrades that give you rerolls. There's guild upgrades that give you more actions. There's another one that allows you to send more adventurers. There's also a way to upgrade your pub, which generates you more money. Finally, there are prestige upgrades that feature end game scoring opportunities. Now things get interesting if two guilds both attempt to hire builders at once. A skill check is made, again, your skill of your choice, where you're rolling a bunch of dice equal to the skill number. Whoever rolls higher gets to hire builders first. And again, this matters because every builder hired increases the cost for any future builders hired in the same round. The next potential action is hire adventurer. Now there are three levels of adventurers, adept, heroic, legendary, and you have to own at least one adventure of the previous level to hire one. So you can hire an adept, fine, but to get a hero, you have to already have an adept, and to have a legendary, you have to already have a hero. Each adventurer is skilled in at least two of the skills or more, and most of the adventurers feature game-breaking abilities that come into play during specific phases or on specific turns. Generally, the, the heroic and legendary ones have more powerful abilities and are more skilled in either higher numbers in single skills or spread out over multiple skills. Now, the base cost to hire an adventurer is printed on the board, and it depends what round the game is in. Gold used to hired, as I mentioned earlier, has to be placed when giving orders. And you end up spending the entire amount if you hire an adventurer. There's no change here. Now, the reason you might want to assign extra is if two or more guilds attempt to hire the same person, this just makes sense. They go with whoever pays the most. Now, if two guilds offer the same amount of money, now we get into a skill check for the tiebreaker to see who gets to hire. 
And you aren't much of a guild without adventurers, after all, so it's kind of important to get a few of these. <laughs> Plus, every adventurer is worth points. In a way, this is almost a Steffenfeld game. Everything you do, everything you build, everyone you hire is worth points in this game. There's definitely a point salad aspect to Guildmaster. Next thing you can do is attempt a contract. Each contract is going to list one or more skills with a difficulty number under them. Now, some will have matching difficulties, like you can use whatever might or stamina and you need a 15, or other ones will be like guile, you can do it with an eight, but might you need a 16. To complete a contract, you're gonna make a skill check on whatever that specific skill is with the adventurers you assign to complete it. A successful check that hits that difficulty or higher gives an instant reward of points and fame, sorry, gold and fame, money and fame. Most cards also offer a bonus. Now, the bonuses in this game almost always let you take something for yourself or take something away from the other players, often that being the player in the lead. Now, some contracts also feature a boon. These stay in play and can be discarded later to do something. Finally, the player then replaces the card with a face-down card from any of the three contract decks. And the interesting thing here is it's all common contracts. It's up to the players when the higher level contracts come out. If you fail a check, you got nothing. You wasted your turn. Now, I must admit, this is part of the game that annoyed me. It's really easy to fail a skill check, even with a large number of adventurers on a contract. Uh, whereas I would prefer to see a way to succeed without a need to roll if you reached a certain skill level. This particular aspect of the randomness in the game mm -hmm. is frustrating. Like rolling, rolling if you're competing against another player for a... A builder spot is one thing, but these uh, these missions, it was just too easy, no matter what you did, to fail a contract. Yeah, it is definitely a, a dice-based game. Um, there is ways to mitigate it. Like I said, the, the upgrades that let you skill upgrades are huge. You can reroll dice or you can set dice. Um, but to help you with this, the back of the rule book actually has a probability chart. And Sean's right. Even with 10 dice, there is still a chance you could roll all once. So it is possible to fail. There is a strong random element to this game. Now, if two or more guilds attempt the same contract to try to do it, you end up with what to me feels very much like a role-playing game. If two parties come up and they both are about to capture the unicorn together, you're going to start negotiating. Players have the option of cooperating. And if they do, they'll split the rewards. Um, they have to negotiate how, and then either each can attempt to check on their own with their own adventurers. And if either player succeeds, they succeed together, or you can choose to combine your adventures. Like I'm going to take my adventure and I need Sean's adventure. I'm going to put those two together and make one combined check. And again, if we succeed, we split as we previously agreed. The thing is, before you actually do this, you're going to take this little token that's got a, a stop and a thumbs up on it, and you're going to see if one of you decides to um, try to do it on their own. And you're going to reveal that in a prisoner's dilemma style system, because you may choose to just forget it. I want to do it on my own. Well, if you both decide, or all three of you, it could be up to, you could all four guilds could actually be attempting the same thing. If everyone decides to go in on their own, you're all going to make a skill check, but you get minus one for every die you use which trust me, that is a significant penalty that can add up. The player with the highest difference between the skill check they needed and the, the, the what they rolled wins the contract. Now, it's also possible that you're going to agree to cooperate and then one person conflicts and the other person decides to go for it. Well, then the person who conflicted gets to try it on their own. They suffer that minus one penalty, and if they succeed, too bad for the other player, you got there first. Now, if you have multiple people conflicting, if they all fail, the people who decide to cooperate then get a chance at it. It's a little bit confusing. This is probably the most confusing part of the game, but basically a prisoner's dilemma with up to four involved parties. The final action you can do that, that, that you can assign your people is to complete a private contract. Every player starts with two private contracts at the start of the game, and you're going to earn up to three more during play depending on how long your game is. Now, instead of attempting a contract at the board, you always have the option of completing a private contract. Interestingly, you can also attempt a private contract if you end up that your order is invalidated, whether that's another guild beat you to it or you failed the skill check to complete the thing, you still get to do something. Now, completing a private contract works the same as completing a public one, same type of skill check. And my same annoyance with the roles applies here. <laughs> 
Now there is one final option that I personally think is kind of the wall wall. There's nothing else you can do. If you've got nothing better to do with the team, or if you get shut out on an order and you have no private contracts, you can do this thing called wandering. You pick a skill check, you roll the dice and you get fame and or gold, but it's like one for every 10 you roll. So it, you don't get much. This is honestly, like I said, this is kind of the I screwed up kind of thing where it's the, 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 um, the no prize when someone else takes something from you and you're like, well, at least you get something out of it. Now, all these actions technically don't take place during the plot phase, right? Right. Your plan or not plot the order phase. These actually take place in the action phase, which happens after everyone's completed their orders. Now, the way this works is everyone does order one, then everyone does order two, then everyone does order three if there is one. And if anyone's earned the fourth order, they get to do it. Note only one person can actually have fourth orders. And all of these also happen in specific order. So when doing order one, building happens before recruiting. Recruiting adepts happens before recruiting heroes and so on. And contracts are done in order of A, B, C, D, E, F. So timing can be very important. Yeah, it becomes obvious as you play, but it's very fiddly, albeit for very good reasons. <laughs> yes. Uh, one of the things I did note earlier is the rule book is very succinct. So take it very literally. If you look up a rule, take it how it says. Don't question it. Go with what it says because they know what they're doing. Now, after everyone's completed their actions, there is a reset phase. You clear your order boards. Um, you're going to collect income. That's based on what level your bar is in your guild. Um, the builder track resets. And also three times during the game, uh, in three, six, and nine turns, three, six, and nine are what's called the blue, blood moon phase. Uh, the contracts and adventurers on the board are wiped and replaced by new ones, which is actually a really nice mechanic because sometimes stuff gets out that just no one can complete. And it's nice that there's something there to wipe it. Finally, once you've replaced any cards that need to be replaced, you flip up all the new stuff and you start a new phase, a new, a new round. Now, at the end of the reset phase in round nine, the game ends. There is a little tiny bit of end game scoring. You are going to score fame for your remaining money, one point for every five gold, and for those prestige upgrades I mentioned earlier. Player, the guild with the most fame runs the city. And I must admit, the moon phase timing mechanism is both fun and thematic. Yeah. It's a nice minor thing that's just really a nice touch in the game. Yeah, I didn't really go into detail on it, but honestly, every turn the moon flips between it's it's either either in full or not. And that affects the cost of things and some of the character abilities only go off at certain times. And which which really leads me to my next point. This is how the game plays overall. This is a card driven game. This is a game where you're collecting hands of cards and playing adventures and these adventurers have abilities and your contracts have boons that you can save up and spend and there's bonuses on the contracts and they all do all kinds of interesting things um most of the the contract things are actually about as i mentioned earlier about helping players who are behind in fame by giving the money for everyone that's ahead of them like a lot of the cards are get something for everyone ahead of you or penalize the people who are in front and that you always have, tend to have that decision help yourself or hurt someone else so uh, now that we've got a good idea of how to play Guildmaster, what did you think of this fantasy take that card driven game so i mentioned this most recently in my code monkey going bananas review last week but i am a big fan of program movement games uh, ever since the original Avalon Hill Robo Rally, I've been uh, uh, somewhat obsessed with hidden programming, program my thing, reveal it and see what happens. That was my main draw for Guildmaster. What really made me want to check it out. Plus, the theme just sounded cool. Like, this sounds like running a fantasy adventurer's guild. And it, they, they mechanized that. And that sounded fascinating. Now, once I actually sat down to play Guildmaster, the first thing I was impressed by was the presentation and component quality. Uh, the player screens in particular are some of the best I've ever seen in a board game. Like, not only do they look cool, like they look like adventuring guilds and all four of them are unique. They are extremely functional, not only for hiding what you're planning from the other players, because they, they, they form almost a full square, but they also feature a complete rule summary on the back of them. Like these screens effectively remove the need to look up things in the book, which is fantastic. Yeah. Now, while I'm a bit down on this game, I won't in any way bash the materials or quality mm -hmm. of what you get with it. They did an excellent job of making this game attractive, playable and thematic. 
yeah, overall, the production quality is excellent. Um, the boards, very well designed and easy to read. The design actually makes the flow of the actions. Like I said, it's kind of so you know what happens before what. Well, it's all left to right, top to bottom, as you'd expect. Uh, there are nice little touches in, included in the game, like to indicate you're done programming. You actually have a silk banner with your, your heraldry on the end of it. You grape over the edge of your guild hall to say, I'm done programming. Just things are actually like a, a step above what you'd expect. Even more impressive, though, to me, than the presentation. Presentation's great. The gameplay is even better. This game could look half as good, and I would still love it because the gameplay is so solid. This is an excellent program movement game that does a fantastic job of tying that theme of running an adventurer's guild to the mechanics. The actions you take are just what you think a fantasy guild would do. You're, you're going to improve your guild hall. You're going to improve the bar. You're going to add stables you're going to hire new heroes and you're going to send those heroes out to complete contracts even the way you assign heroes on specific tasks like oh, i am sending these two to go talk to the builders and i'm handing them 10 gold to do it like it just makes sense it just makes sense as far as the theme and the mechanics and then the steps taken for each action are even kind of logical, right? Like you need money to hire builders. And when you do hire them, there's less builders available. So the next builders charge more. When two people attempt to hire the same adventurer, of course, the person who offers the most money is who they go with. You end up pairing your adventures with similar skills to increase your chances of completing contracts. or you're doing a whole teamwork thing. Even the negotiation system, when two or more guilds meet, just feels like a group of adventurers meeting up and trying to decide whether to work together or not. And there's always that chance. The one team's going to be like, no, we're going it on our own. Screw you. Now, without chance, without question, this isn't some painted on theme with loosely connected mechanics mm -hmm. and fluffy abstractions. This is in your face fantasy adventure guild management in a town where only one guild will take home the riches. Now, the big potential issue this game has is that betrayal element. This is not a cooperative game, nor is it in any way multiplayer solitaire. This is not your traditional Euro game. In this game, you are competing with the other guilds, and that competition can get nasty. Bribery, negotiation, and backstabbing is not only an aspect of the game, it is encouraged, and I would say, except in the most peaceful group imaginable, inevitable, it's going to happen. You can literally, in this game, bribe another player with as many coins as you want for anything. Like, I want you to go to the builder before Sean, so I'll give you three guild if you program that in your one spot. Totally legit in this game. And binding. Now, the cutthroat nature means there is no way this game is going to be for everyone. This is never going to be on a list of must-have games everyone should own. Also, unlike other good games publishing games like Unfair, which we recently reviewed, there's no way to dial down these take that elements. There's no game changers here to make it a more friendly game. The take that nature of this game is a core aspect of the game. And I honestly think the game wouldn't really work if they were removed. That's what this game's about. Yeah, and along with the rolling for uh, completing contracts, this is where the game falls outside of my preferences. Mm -hmm. It's a great game, and I can't find much fault with it. I just personally don't enjoy this type of game. Which is totally fair. Now, what I did like about the Take That Elements is it's not in your face all the time. It's not ever present. It's going to happen. Well, we found competition for builders. That's something that tended to come up every round. Someone's going to rush to build builders. Someone's going to get there before you. The builder cost is going to go up. But the competition for hiring adventurers happened much less often. And it was easier to predict. It was easier to be like, oh, you're probably going to go for that guy, so I'm going to go for this guy. Or you happen to have that ability that lets you program it in slot two, but do it first, so I'm not even going to try this turn because I know it's a full moon. Like, it was more predictable. And yes, it happened. But even then, you could just throw a ton of gold at it to make sure you got the one you really needed. And then actual competition for contracts was even more rare because it's based on the number of players. In a full game, there are six contracts up. And matching up not only the contract you want to compete, but in the same slot was fairly rare. Now, while it did come up a few times every game, it's not like you spent every round, every turn negotiating with other players. It was just part of the game that would come up now and then. So, of course, this will be impacted somewhat by player count. Yes, very true. Speaking of player count, 
I do have to mention this. Um, this is something I mentioned in my earlier reviews, our, our previews when we were talking about playing this for the few, few times. I definitely prefer Guildmaster at three and four players. Now, while the game works perfectly fine at two players, in no way is it broken, all the mechanics work, everything's there, you just have less spots to choose from. And yes, it can become quite the cutthroat game of cat and mouse with two experienced players. I found that almost all aspects of the game were improved with more players, especially at four. We have the most interaction at four, and this is a game about interaction. Yeah, not at all surprising when you look at the mechanisms involved in the game. Overall, I personally really enjoyed Guildmaster. And to be honest, this is a game where I'm still having fun discovering it and trying new combos and trying different things. I've actually enjoyed this every time I play, I enjoy it more. I'm like, oh yeah, this is good. We got to play again. Let's get together next weekend and play some more Guildmaster. My wife feels the same. And my sister-in-law actually considers this to be one of her favorite games of all time. That said, I do know people who didn't enjoy this game, like Sean here. Well, my usual home group embraced the take that nature of the game. Sean doesn't really enjoy games with this much skullduggery, though I still find that so strange because you were always playing the thieves in our Warhammer games and like, like your whole Warhammer archetype was to run a guild and here's your chance to do it. So again, I love the idea of the game and it's been themed so well. It was just not hitting the spot for me. Negotiations in particular are something I tend to avoid in real life and I'm going to avoid them in games as well. Fair enough. Gaming's most be fun. Don't want to stress yourself out. So totally fair. If you don't mind, take that element. If you're not like Sean and you do like negotiating, I'd suggest checking out Guildmaster. Now, if you're a fan of the fantasy theme and you want that feeling of running an adventurer's guild, if you've ever wanted to be the head of the Thieves Guild, you could probably pick this one up and not expect to have any regrets. Just blind, you don't even need to try it first. Guildmaster does a fantastic job of integrating that adventuring guild theme with its mechanics. Now, if you are a fan of like diplomacy style games and negotiations and love games where you work together with someone only to stab them in the back three turns later, this could be the perfect game for you, even if you're not a huge fantasy fan. Now, if you don't like games featuring backstabbing and or negotiations, this is probably not going to be for you. Now, if the theme does school, sound cool, you do, you may want to try it out. You might want to give it a shot just to see, because like we're not talking about playing werewolf or coup where you're lying to someone in their face. It's more subversive than that. And this is not a game where you have to lie to your friends necessarily. You just might flip over that token to the not com cooperate side every now and then when doing a contract. Now, speaking of trying out Guildmaster, you can play this game for free on Tabletopia. Mm -hmm. We've done this, and while the interface isn't perfect, it works pretty well, better than some other games we've tried on that platform. <laughs> now, do note, however, that it's not fully scripted and no. doesn't teach you how to play the game. Yeah, the rule book is present there, so you can read it, but you're going to have to figure it out yourself, unfortunately. Well, that's it for our look at Guildmaster from Good Games Publishing. We welcome you to read more about this game in the review section of our blog over at tabletopbellhop.com.